So the title of this panel is Teaching the Environment at Fudan University in Shanghai and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. The panelists are Miles Powell at Nanyang Technological University, Kira Alexandra Rose, also Nanyang Technological University, and Shuao Jing Sun at Fudan University. And it's going to be moderated by Robin Visser. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tanya. And I have introduced our panelists who are also, they have, their brief bios are also in your program. But I've introduced them on the pre-recorded video. So with no further ado. to our session on teaching the environment at Fudan University, Shanghai, and Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. I have with me three scholars, each of whom work in disciplines that differ from each other in environmental humanities and environmental studies. And I'll briefly introduce them because you have their full bios before you. So starting with Miles Powell, he is an assistant professor of environmental history at Nyong Technical University in Singapore. His first book, Vanishing America, Species Extinction, Racial Peril, and the Origins of Conservation was published by Harvard University Press in 2016. And it explores connections between the American conservation movement and the nation's eugenics, immigration restriction, and population control movements. He's presently researching global environmental history of human interactions with sharks. So welcome, Miles. Thank you. And our uh, second scholar is Kira Alexander-Rose. He is a postdoctoral research fellow in English at Nanyang Technical Uni Technological University with a PhD in comparative literature from Princeton University. Her first book project, Healing Thought, the Material Imagination in 20th Century Fiction, analyzes how prominent transatlantic writers instrumentalize elemental forces to teach us about imaginative creation and expand our views on perception, human, non-human categories, spirituality, and gender. In her current project, Watermarks, Political and Aesthetic Afterlives of an Element, investigates shifting representations of water in contemporary transnational literature, art, and film. So welcome, Kira. And our uh, third and final participant is Xiaojin Sun, who's a professor in the School of Journalism at Fudan University in Shanghai. He did his doctoral work um, at Kent State University and the University of Virginia, and he served on faculties at the University of Maryland and Weber State University in the US prior to moving to Fudan University. His research spans across new media studies, health and environmental communication, and media morality. He studied media coverage of climate change and public responses to media messaging about environmental pollution. And he's currently studying how emerging technologies such as nanotechnology, GMOs, and AI affect and constitute social and political discourse. So welcome, Xiaojin. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, some questions about your experience teaching the environment in your respective universities. Um, I noticed that Miles and Kira, you both have experienced team teaching what seems to be large interdisciplinary courses on the environment, such as in Introduction to Sustainability or the Environmental Nexus, in addition to teaching courses in your own discipline, such as the Environmental History of Oceans or the Ecological Thought, Environmental Consciousness, and Literature. And Xiaojing, I understand that your teaching focuses on communication about the environment such as health communication in mass media, social media, and political meetings and whatnot. And so each of you teaches environmental humanities from different perspectives of environmental history, literature and the arts and communication. But you do seem to share a focus on narrative and images, whether historical, literary, or media messaging and visuals. So, I'd like to start with this question. The theme of our conference is beyond despair. 
And how do you teach in ways that move your students beyond despair? What stories and images might help with that? I guess I feel that, first of all, a, a little bit of despair isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but in terms of moving students beyond despair, uh, I guess my first strategy would be introducing them to historical and, and contemporary cultures that uh, possessed some degree of, for lack of a better word, sustainability in their interactions with their environment. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is peoples who certainly have modified their environment, but not denuded it in doing so. So, for instance, uh, in my environmental history of oceans class, students look at indigenous fisheries that uh, took significant harvest without depleting resources. Um, they all read the first few chapters of Jay Taylor's Making Salmon uh, and his discussion of the indig indigenous salmon fisheries of the Pacific Northwest, for instance, and we discuss that. Um, and then beyond that, I try to encourage students to consider environments that we might define as hybrid environments, so neither entirely natural nor entirely artificial, and to think about the ways that those environments, although altered by humans, still possess some sort of value, um, ecologically speaking. And I especially try to bring that point home because I find that a, a number of my students, at least in my environmental history classes, feel that uh, there's very little need for environmental protection or conservation in Singapore because there's no nature left. Uh, and so you, you can often kind of engage the students and surprise the students by demonstrating uh, the remaining biodiversity, even in very modified spaces. So in my courses, I essentially had my students look at sources that do emphasize doom and gloom and catastrophe alongside some of the work that's coming out of climate communication research. So on the side of catastrophe, we looked at a novel by Paolo Bacigalupi called The Water Knife. And going through the lens of climate communication research, so in terms of what scholars are saying might deactivate the public or merely serve as entertainment, I basically had students place them to conversation and try to pick out ways in which this catastrophizing material might have this effect through its approach to negative framing and sensationalism. That's, that's one example. And then we also did look at sources that engage with activism, which is a very direct intervention and a hopeful form of engagement. Uh, yeah, and uh, in fact, for in my class, and uh, our focus is really on different sorts of messages. And uh, we look at uh, messages uh, uh, covering uh, video, uh, verbal messages, uh, as well as pictures, uh, audio messages. And uh, when we talk about despair, I think that you know the key here is that you know what we can. Uh, I think another word that really comes into my mind is hope, because in my in my class, and uh, we want to we did we discuss what the hope is for um, for the future environment. So uh, with my students, um, uh, we look, we watched some um, classic as well as some, um, uh, as well as some uh, contemporary uh, popular messages on different media platforms. Um, with uh, some of those messages come from uh, documentaries and some of those messages are created by, let's say, netizens or uh, activist individuals. Uh, we look at those messages, analyze uh, what kind of frames are provided, uh, what kind of frame, how those messages are framed, and what are the key concepts uh, covered in those messages. Um, and uh, uh, for uh, I, I still remember that you know uh, in, in my class uh, with my students, we specifically uh, compare messages uh, coming from different cultures and different countries. Um, for instance, that in one documentary from the U.S. is an inconvenient truth, and at the same time, we look at another documentary, which is under the dome, uh, crafted by a Chinese journalist, and we look at those uh, met both documentaries and compare them and see how they are framed differently, and the students will learn that okay, if we want to influence uh, the public uh, uh, living in a specific culture, and uh, what we should, uh, uh, how can we free, uh, frame uh, the message in a way that uh, can really touch them 
and uh, speak to their souls. And that way, I think that you know there is a possibility for us to um, uh, to to uh, to help the uh, to help the public see the hope for the future. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's what I. Thank you. Our I just have one brief follow-up question. Um, yeah. Are you able to boil down in one or two sentences what the different framing is between an inconvenient truth, which probably most of our audience has seen, and Under the Dome by Chai Jing? What would you say is the primary difference between the framing in these two cultures? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the uh, inconvenient truth really uh, touches a lot on science. It uh, uses a lot of scientific uh, scientific evidence. But under the dome, I, 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 it's more about uh, a story from uh, ordinary citizens, and you, through those, those stories are deeply embedded in the Chinese society. Um, so I would say that uh, it's uh, why it's tailored more. Uh, Oriented more towards uh, scientific evidence, but the other way it's to, uh, oriented more um, towards uh, public life and the daily lives, uh, uh, and those kind of evidence come from uh, uh, citizens and uh, uh, some maybe some different stakeholders. Excellent, thank you. So, when you teach these courses, whether they're large undergraduate courses or small graduate seminars, what do you find motivates your students to study the environment? In my class, I think that my students are more uh, intrigued by uh, by uh, environmental questions uh, uh, associated with the power of messages. And for instance, in my class, um, I uh, we discuss a topic re uh, related to the use uh, the uses of different uh, jargons and uh, uh, terms uh, in discussing uh, climate change, and uh, uh, students are so uh, uh, are very interested in the difference uh, of the power of di of different terms. Uh, for instance, that for instance that when, when I talk about climate change, students tend to think about oh, this is really uh, this topic is, uh, sounds a little bit distant and it's uh, more about the future. But when we talk about uh, global warming, and the students tend to realize oh, this is uh, you know it seems that uh, it seems to be related to our immediate uh, uh, presence, and uh, uh, it's more related to uh, the current uh, extreme weather. Uh, so uh, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, kind of different language or different, uh, 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 I would say that uh, usage of, uh, of frames and uh, can show that how powerful a message is, and uh, those kinds of uh, different messages may lead, take us to different directions. So students are interested, uh, very interested in exploring uh, exploring how those messages can serve as interventions to mobilize the public or uh, and to change the students uh, to change the public attitudes and perceptions as well as the responses to uh, responses to uh, like what's happening around them it's particularly extreme weather and some uh, I would say that it, like uh, environmental conditions that are uh, that are around them um, in terms of motivating students to study the environment in Singapore I feel like there are a number of preconceptions, at least in my courses, that I've had to overcome. Uh, one of which, as I mentioned before, is this sense that there is no nature in Singapore. A another is a, a very pervasive kind of national narrative in which uh, economic development was essential and the number one priority, and the environment kind of had to be sacrificed to facilitate that. And I, I don't necessarily absolutely refute that narrative, but I try to present some counterpoints to it. Uh, I also find my students often feel that because Singapore is such a small nation, uh, it, can, it contributes very little to these you know, grand global calamities like climate change. And conversely, they also feel that uh, because of its kind of uh, insulated position, uh, Singapore is, is shielded from the ramifications of uh, those types of global changes, such as extreme weather, uh, as Xiao Jing was mentioning. And so, so I try to demonstrate um, in my classes the, the inextricability of uh, human societies and nations and their environments, and, and to demonstrate to my students that Singapore is no exception to that kind of general rule. Mm. Excellent. Yes. Uh, 
from its foundations, uh, Singapore has basically incorporated sustainability into a lot of its governance and its policies. And this has been a way for Singapore to project itself, to project the city state as a leader mm -hmm. uh, in development, in business, and in civic responsibility and what it means to be a good citizen, mm -hmm. to basically project its model as a good global model. But that also means that my students grew up aware of climate change and grew up knowing that it's happening. So what they found most surprising is that there isn't that kind of consensus elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why our units on climate change communication were quite helpful in placing that into perspective mm -hmm. and in showing how those debates play out in the United States, mm -hmm. for instance, where, where that debate is highly polarized. And again, because students were mostly exposed to climate change messages in the context of Singapore, they were excited about the opportunity to engage these issues on a global level and to draw connections between the local and the global. And the class gave them the opportunity to engage in debates and discussions about that. Thank you. Uh, Xiao Jing, I am going to turn to another topic. I saw that you teach a graduate seminar, uh, Applied Communication in China, and it focuses on a range of issues, but one is how issues around the environment are viewed, discussed, and governed in China. And I just, I'm curious, when you teach a course like that, or some of your other courses that touch on environmental communication or health concerns related to the environment, are there, do you find that such courses differ um, from your experience teaching in North America? And this would apply to all, all three of you. Do you find teaching in Singapore and Shanghai fundamentally differs and an adjunct question might be are there topics in either locale that you are discouraged from talking about and maybe encouraged to talk about I mean is there a, is there an issue with that as well well um, I uh, topic wise I think that the, I don't think I, I kind of see much difference I think that I know, uh, at least in my class it, because it's, it's a graduate class so uh, a discussion is really very encouraged between the faculty uh, fac uh, faculty and the graduate students mm -hmm. and basically we really can touch on uh, whatever topic you know uh, I think it, it, uh, I can cover uh, in the US and uh, but I think that one difference is that uh, I because in my class, I really want to. Uh, I really want. Uh, oftentimes in the class, I raise examples uh, that uh, that are. Very, I would say that you know that happened or uh, that are more discussed in China. And but I, I, at the same time, I realize that uh, many of those perspectives or mainstream uh, mainstream uh, discourses uh, come from the West. Uh, so, so I think I think that is a challenge. So, I mean, these uh, these examples come from China, but uh, the discourse, the mainstream discourses, come from the West. So, uh, they don't match each other very well. I mean, based on my experience, uh, I think that is a very challenging part. How to uh, really, uh, you know, um, at least uh, show my students that uh, there are uh, what kind of discourse. Are there alternative discourses that we can turn to and look at this issue differently? Um, but, uh, but, 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 but the thing is that, um, but, but the thing is that those messages, I would say, uh, uh, those mainstream uh, discourses are more powerful, and students have been exposed to them for a long time. So, uh, I, I, you know what I mean. In, in this case, that for me. Uh, I think that I, I'm really trying to challenge the mainstream discourse, uh, uh, but uh, but students don't have that, that much experience with that. Uh, it's, it's kind of a clash there. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think I do know what you mean. I, I teach a course in University of North Carolina called Chinese Environmental Literature. Yeah. And in that course, we look at ancient philosophies and um, histories you know, the Mencius and Confu the Confucian scholar yeah, yeah. Mencius writes yes. about environmental issues of deforestation and Zhuangzi is a Taoist who yes. arguably has a different approach to understanding 
his cosmology is different, right? So, yeah, exactly. so yeah. I, um, I find that when I teach about the environment to students who major in environmental studies in the US, they find that course quite shocking <laughs> in, <laughs> in terms of a very different approach to understanding environmental issues. But so I think I do have some understanding of what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, exactly. About. So, uh, so, so, so let me just elaborate a little bit. So I would say that, you know, um, Chinese students understanding uh, really, I'm, uh, I mean, so uh, we, we know that in recent years, China is more open to the West, um, but those kind of traditional thinking uh, coming from uh, traditional Chinese philosophies are still, I, I would say that are still uh, very prevalent in this society. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the thing is that those kind of Chinese traditional philosophy uh, 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 pertaining to uh, environmentalism have not been well translated into mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that just tells that students do not have uh, do not have very, I would say, easy access to those kinds of messages, you know, through mass, main media, uh, mass media or uh, other very popular communication platforms. So I'm going to just shift our conversation to your areas of research, which I know overlap with what you teach about, but each of you is engaged in such fascinating research areas, and I'd love for each of you to answer how has your particular field of study changed over the last 10 years in relation to study of the environment and and related to that what are the most what do you think today are the most pressing issues from your vantage point just from your vantage point i think the biggest shift i've noticed which is a good shift is a globalization of the field so uh again not just western centric scholarship but we're starting to get new and more holistic approaches to environmental scholarship, whether that ranges from scholarship on the global south to Asia to across the board. And again, I tried to choose representative materials for my classes so we would get to explore that ourselves. Um, I would say, yes, I would say in addition to that, there has been, again, a good shift of emphasis to unequal impacts of climate disruption on different communities, as well as social justice. I think social justice is really a robust and growing field of study, and also something that I myself am engaging in. I would also say that there has started to be a movement away from despair to hope and resilience. And probably there will be more engagement with climate communication in the future. Either I say this because I think that's what should happen, it may be effective, or because it will naturally evolve that way because of what environmental humanities scholars are already starting. And then of course, because I, I work on water, I find that to be one of our most pressing issues mm -hmm. on a global level mm -hmm. and, and something that requires intervention. For me, that intervention I think comes through messaging, comes through imagery and metaphor, through strategic ways of trying to shift perception, which in turn may influence action and policy. You mentioned earlier in the conversation, activism as an antidote to despair. Is that also something you and your students engage in? Yes, yes, absolutely. So for example, uh, one of our units, we covered uh, Wangari Matai and the Green Belt Movement mm -hmm. in Kenya where I, I, I had the students uh, watch a short video about it and uh, actually read some of her memoir, Unbowed, mm -hmm. and discuss that from a gender and deforestation perspective. Also, I covered uh, the activist art of someone named Basha Erland, who I actually brought as one of the keynote speakers to a symposium I held here. She's wonderful, and basically for years, she's been doing work on international waterways and getting the community involved in her art and conservation projects. Mm -hmm. So I brought that into the classroom. And the students responded well. Yes, yes, I had them read. Uh, so Basha writes blogs for National Geographic from the perspective of international waterways oh, okay. as, as a way of, again, bringing the reader closer to the history of that waterway by writing about it from its point of view. Right. And, and I had students read that and had us talk about it and how that brings us closer. 
What about you, Xiao Jing? My per I would say that my personal research really paralleled uh, the uh, evolution of uh, technologies and uh, um, specifically media technologies. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so I, I basically, uh, I'm, uh, my research is uh, focused on how uh, technologies are really uh, influencing uh, or affecting uh, the diffusion of uh, envir environmental, uh, environmental, uh, environmentalism related messages and how those different technologies can be uh, utilized to uh, disseminate uh, good messages or quality messages to influence the public. Um, and I think, I, I think that um, the key of, from, from my own, from my own, per, own perspective, I think the key here is that uh, we, uh, technologies are really have brought about tremendous benefits you know, to the whole society, uh, and it really affords uh, much easier access to information. That is definitely uh, the upside of uh, these technologies. But on the other hand, we got to be, uh, we got to realize that uh, uh, because of the I would say because of the conveniences of technologies, and uh, at the same time that uh, there is too much, I would say, uh, misinformation, uh, disinformation, or even fake news and uh, some uh, low quality information related to the environment that might uh, also take us to some uh, directions which are which may not be conducive to uh, to, uh, to the environment. So uh, then we need to. Uh, uh, I'm, my research is uh, my research. Uh, my research is focused on how to create quality messages and uh, where does the power of those mess uh, good messages really come from. And that, uh, furthermore, how to disseminate those messages to reach out to a larger audience. Uh, yeah, I find it very difficult to kind of generalize about shifts in the field right now, the field of environmental history, because it seems like a lot of simultaneous things are happening. Uh, on the one hand, it seems like uh, maybe the original generation of environmental historians, at least in the United States, are, are kind of backing off some of their um, more significant uh, scholarly contributions, um, their, their critiques of mainstream environmentalism, uh, the people that were excluded from it, the people that were expelled from environments deemed wilderness, things like that. It, it, um, and that aspect of changes in the field right now, it reminds me of the way Bruno Latour is kind of backing away from the science wars, right? And, uh, and, and it, I think there are similar processes at work in the sense that uh, in both cases, people are fearful uh, of undermining the credibility of in, in Latour's case, scientists, maybe particularly climate scientists, and in environmentalism, worried about uh, undermining the efficacy of environmentalism. And yet, at the same time that you have maybe that original generation backing off some of their more provocative arguments, you have a new generation of young scholars, um, potentially more diverse scholars, who are insisting on a, a much broader field that goes beyond that mainstream environmentalism and looks at uh, other types of environmentalisms, whether that means a more global perspective, as Kira suggested, or whether that means incorporating the perspective of increasing numbers of uh, non-white people and other marginalized people. Uh, so you have that one dimension of the field where there, there really seems to be a tension in place. And at the same time, I, I think the other big shift in the field um, is is efforts to incorporate technology, maybe along similar lines to what Xiao Jing was discussing. Uh, I, I see constant job postings right now for kind of digital humanities, digital environmental history. And it, it seems like we're still kind of working through exactly uh, what kind of new insights we can derive from those technologies, but that certainly seems to be the direction, one of the directions the field is heading in. So we started our conversation today with me asking you how you move your students beyond despair. What I'd like you to answer for our audience as the final question is, have you in your research and teaching personally moved beyond despair? I think that it's important to have room for a bit of despair. 
Uh, in fact, one of the first essays that I assigned to my students is uh, Ted Gostomsky's Grief and Change, where he's adopting the Kubler-Ross model of grieving and loss. And it's his way of going through how, how the individual and a society could cope with what is inevitably coming <laughs> because we simply can't act fast enough. However, he does end that with the need for resilience because that, that is the solution that's left, to be resilient and to find ways that we can tackle the problem in spite of certain things that we can't change. That is why still the, the stories that we tell, the narratives that we craft, how that might shift depending on the moment is extremely important. And there should always be space for that. And it's powerful. It does have an impact. I believe and will continue to believe. Um, you, you might you might attend research, and uh, I, I I typically uh, talk with my students, and uh, we tend to uh, we we tend to agree that environmental risks are uh, are there, and uh, this is a, a rock solid fact. But uh, that does not mean that we should trap ourselves uh, selves in despair. And uh, uh, the thing is that um, if we when students uh, can see some changes are really taking place then there is hope for the future so but uh, uh, but we uh, but what we can do to make better changes what can to make better changes happen and to make changes occur uh, uh, faster and uh, uh, to take place at a larger a wider uh, uh, at a societal scale uh, that uh, really entails uh, better communication strategies uh, and uh, communication is uh, a power is, is a power of intervention that means it can, if communication uh, strategies or messages can be um, used in a very uh, effective manner, uh, it can definitely it can induce better changes in the society. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that we do need to uh, dig into uh, dig into the nature of communication. And sometimes I tell my students, uh, communication should give uh, communication should give uh, people hope. Uh, Hope is the thing with the feathers, and uh, sometimes you may not see uh, it very clearly. But you need to—it's uh, not just about the cognitive analysis; it's also about your whether you can feel it, whether you can really you have the intuition. So there is intuition there, there's a feeling there, and there is a cognitive uh, a cognitive analysis there. So those messages you need to look at those messages for, at different levels, and if those messages can be crafted. Um, better, and then uh, we need, we also need to think about how to uh, communicate them out uh, in a better, a more effective manner. And a good communication can make good changes. So that is where hope can come from. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, I, I don't think that I've moved personally um, entirely beyond despair. Uh, I do think that the situation is quite dire and bleak. Uh, that said, I, I suppose there is a sliver of hope, and this is a case in which the, the stakes are so high that I think even a sliver of hope can be extremely motivating and inspiring. Uh, and I hope that um, I, I can seal <laughs> some of my despair in my interactions with my students because I do try to move beyond despair in my speeches. As the great writer Lu Xun said, save the children. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we have built in some time for Q&A. Our interlocutors are on chat. They may be getting the feed slightly delayed, so we need to just keep that in mind. And I think for this session in particular, if you have questions for Robin, you can address those to Robin. We might, this might also be the format where we would welcome a bit more just reflections rather than questions, just because we're not totally sure how the back and forth will work. But we welcome your reflections and questions to Robin, and hopefully our panelists can also weigh in. Thank you. And, and um, Brooke Andrade, our library director, is going to run the mic to you. If I, if I could add, they are chatting with me right now, so they've watched the live stream, and they're all on chat. If you want to ask them directly, I can at least type the question if they can't hear it. So. 
So, Robin, this is a question for either you or Xiaojing. Okay. Xiaojing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised to hear that he's able to to um, teach beyond the uh, or under the dome mm -hmm. in China. And so, I was wondering if you you or he might talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to ask if he'd like to answer. And while I'm waiting for his response, he might not have heard. This is what I'm trying to see is, can they hear these questions right now? Um, I, I can answer the question, though, partially. Let me contextualize that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it, it, sh it showed widely in China. Yes. And it was very popular. Yes. A lot of people saw it in a very few days, but then it was banned. That's correct. So yes. it's interesting that it's being taught. So um, I'll just give you a little bit of, there's a slight delay, but they are hearing the question. So he might be typing an answer. And in the meanwhile, I'll respond. So Under the Dome was as influential a documentary as an inconvenient truth was back in the day, which the young people might not even ever have seen by Al Gore. But Under the Dome was aired in, I'm sorry, I forgot the year, 2015 possibly, um, by Chai Jing, who was a very well-known television personality who had told the story initially from the vantage point of her child who was ill, a toddler, and, uh, and then from her personal story, which Xiao Jing referred to, he said a lot of the stories in Under the Domes, they moved to scientific facts, but they started with very personal stories of experiences that people in her own community had. Eventually, in this documentary, people started to branch out and talk about citizen scientists and the data that they gathered. But anyway, it was aired, it went viral, and then it was banned after about three days. Although there are always ways to get around the Great Firewall of China, and so I think other people still did have access to it. Now, um, he mentioned, oh, yes, okay, please answer the question. <laughs> by typing. Thank you for bearing with our technological complications here. Um, he's going to answer the question, but I know that from talking to other professors from China, um, when you teach graduate seminars in China, there's quite a bit of leeway, basically. And uh, it, the undergraduate curriculum is more controlled, standardized, and um, monitored. So that would be my short answer to why he can teach the documentary. Um, he said this documentary can make such a great wave to the great extent that this is also due to the power of social media. Uh, he hasn't answered why he can teach it, but I think I'll just respect that he did answer that on the original question. So I think I, I can answer it as I just did. I, it's fairly, there is a real difference between graduate education and undergraduate education in China. And that uh, actually, it's interesting that under the period of um, Mao, for about 30 years, there were um, foreign media was not allowed among the general population, for example. I'm talking about literature or te television or film. However, there were always the top level of society, the most elite artists and intellectuals did always have access to foreign forms of information. And even during the Maoist period, even during the most um, restrictive periods, there was something called the inside archive that people had access to if they were from more elite sectors in society, intellectuals. So I think there's a little bit of a parallel today with graduate school education as opposed to undergraduate education. Robin, this is a question for you and for everybody. And I really enjoyed hearing all the uh, Asian, South A Asian perspectives. Um, it's a question about the transfer of the huge carbon footprint that the West has put on Asia, South Asia, and uh, other countries. And um, I want to know if students in Singapore and in China 
are aware of the huge transfer of the carbon footprint that the West has put and the liability that the uh, Asian and South Asian countries continue to bear uh, from, uh, from uh, Western economic colonialism. I'm typing the question for them. Uh, from US. OK. Um, while I wait for their responses, I'll just say uh, I, I, I teach college students from China at Duke most summers. They come for a one month program. And I also, and I do teach on the environment in that context of that seminar. And I also teach uh, occasionally guest lecture in China. I haven't done that in, for an extended period of time. But um, in general, the average undergraduate from China does is not necessarily aware of this. It, in my experience, uh, graduate students are aware of it. But in recent years, because I teach Chinese literature, there have been some, some very popular science fiction writers of the environment in China who've popularized this notion. There's a, there's a new book coming out by a very famous um, science fiction writer, um, Chen Qiufan, and his book is called Waste Tide. It's actually just now been translated into English, too, so you could get access to it. I think it's going to come out any time now in 2019. And uh, it's all about huge mounds of e-waste in Guang Guangdong province near Hong Kong. And uh, there are cyborgs, and you know, it's, it's really about the radioactivity of the toxins from the huge amounts of e-waste that are being shipped in to China. This is, of course, prior to the 2017 ban, which is shifting things now. But um, also with the recent, I would say with the recent, um, oh, okay, let me just stop and say, uh, Professor Sun Xiaojing, he says that in his opinion, the awareness level in China is relatively low. So he validates what my experience was with Chinese, is with Chinese students. But, uh, I, I will say, though, one thing that meant most students are quite sensitive to because their parents are, are uh, shifts in the trade imbalance and whatnot. So with the, the recent trade issues between the US and China, um, it also raises awareness about what kinds of imports and exports have been allowed into China. So it could be that just recently there's been a shift in awareness. That's just my prediction. but. I could be wrong, so good question, though. I would say graduate students are much more aware, though, of this issue. Thank you very much. That was incredibly uh, insightful and enriching. Um, I'm talking from the perspective of Mediterranean culture, and uh, I will be very interested to know whether in the transnational approach that, for example, Kira was advocating for um, Mediterranean uh, literatures and cultures or countries, political experience are also included. Uh, so I, I would love to know whether uh, alongside with uh, Vangari Matai, she also teaches uh, uh, other, other figures from Mediterranean Europe or um, or, or, or whether uh, there is an interest uh, among the students in Singapore or in China about what happens uh, uh, both in environmental and uh, in political terms uh, in the Mediterranean basin. Thank you. I'm, I've been typing the question. It seems to be disappearing into the ethos. <laughs> Sometimes I can see my questions. That one's, I, these I can't for some reason. So hopefully she's hearing the question will respond. I can't, res uh, while I wait for that, I can't respond to the specifics about Mediterranean European writers. However, I can tell you that the knowledge level of at least graduate students in, of, of international literature is, is very high I, in my experience. Um, and so, for example, uh, we've just learned that Joni Adamson, who is here, her, her works are being translated into Chinese. Her whole corpus is currently being translated because a PhD student from China 
uh, just wrote her dissertation, somebody at Tongji University in Shanghai. So that's an example of the, the, the um, translation industry is alive and well in China, and there's a lot of access to international literature. And eco-literary -liter studies are a very hot field in China right now. And some of the leading theorists of ecological or eco-criticism are, are in China. Yes, Joni, yes. So there is about to be a new article that will be forthcoming from Environmental Humanities, the journal. And it is a, a, a whole group of environmental humanists surveyed all of the environmental humanities um, pedagogies. Mm -hmm. on, we only looked at pedagogies, and we only looked at um, environmental humanities programs that are actually sort of named environmental humanities. Mm -hmm. And we definitely included China. And in China, there's been a huge, huge emphasis on eco-criticism really before the US. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so if you call it ecological criticism, not environmental uh, criticism, mm -hmm. then it's um, the case that, that, that the Chinese were among the first, mm -hmm. which is the reason why the interest um, sort of then went across the straits to Taiwan, and there's such a strong uh, network in Taiwan. Um, but uh, so we'll have a hu we'll have a section in the, in the article about what's going on and has been going on in China since the 1970s yes. um, in um, eco eco literary eco philosophical um, um, pedagogy in China. So look for that. Um, I'm just, I'm getting answers, so I'm going to read some of the answers. Um, I just to follow up on Joni's comment though before I read. Uh, uh, after Germany, my understanding is that Taiwanese literature, which is written in, primarily in Chinese, is the number, it's the number two nation state for producing eco-literature. Um, the Taiwanese environmental activism, social justice movements, and uh, ecological literary movements are completely integrated. It's a very unique island in that sense. Our, our moderators are not from Taiwan, but they're part of the larger Sinophone community. Um, and so I just want to call, have a shout out for Taiwanese uh, eco-literature and activism. It's just very integrated into policy to tie in with our earlier panel as well. Um, most of the writers lead these eco-tours for students in the summer, and they also participate in activism and advocacy at the policy level. So it's it's a very unique place. I'm going to just respond to the question um, about Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean literature, the awareness of that in East Asia. Miles says, yes, we discuss this a great deal in my environmental humanities classes. We look at the fact that so-called developing countries bear, oh, I'm sorry, this is the previous question. They bear the burden of climate change despite contributing to or benefiting from it minimally. We also look at how developing countries, developed countries, are offloading the environmental ramifications of our lifestyles onto developing countries in a number of ways. Thank you for asking a question that highlights this. And then Kira's answer is, in my courses, we did cover unequal impacts through a range of sources. One documentary we watched that brings this to mind is uh, the, the island president about the risk of inundation for the Maldives, Maldives islands. Um, and then I, I haven't seen an answer to the Mediterranean <laughs> literature, yes. OK, yes. Two more questions. Yeah, one thing that um, especially the um, speakers from Singapore made me think of is when they mentioned how the students, their knowledge in the environment, especially in Singapore, is what they see around them. Um, in environmental education research, there's something, I had to write it down, there's something they call intergenerational environmental amnesia. And it's the phenomenon where, especially working with young adults down to children, their perception of nature is what they see. And it's hard for us to think about because it's the idea that your perception of nature is where you were probably as a child. Mm -hmm. You know, I still perceive nature how it was, I won't tell what year, but earlier. <laughs> and how do you... I wonder how you think or how maybe the other panelists could think, um, how can the humanities help alleviate that idea? Because it's hard to build a kind of a global eco-consciousness when 
somebody who grows up in Hong Kong or Singapore or inner city or and even some rural areas are really isolated. That is your perception of what nature is. That's kind of that phenomenon. How can the humanities help with that? Thanks for the question. I'm going to see how they respond. I know Miles talked about it in the longer version of the interview, and he talked about, because Singapore has is such an urbanized place, and yet he talks about introducing the students to the diverse biology in their city-state. So I know he explicitly brings that into his teaching. One way that I address it um, with my students in Chinese environmental literature is I start the course with a response paper before on the very first day of class. And I say, they're supposed to write an essay, free response. How do I relate to my environment? And I, I explicitly try to avoid the word the environment. It's not abstracted. And then when they, when I, pose the question that way, of course, the students start to really think about this question, is the environment something out there? Or is it something that I encounter in my everyday on-campus life or back in my home, wherever that is? And then I ask them the same question at the end of the semester to see if, because most of the Chinese writers that we read understand relations to the environment in a less dualistic way than a less Cartesian-informed way. There's more of an understanding of a connectedness. And often by the end of the class, the students, believe it or not, last semester, it was one of these dead poet society experiences as a teacher because the students felt so connected to their environments by the end of the semester. And that was one of my goals. It doesn't often happen, but it happened in that semester. But the problem of intergenerational amnesia is one Jeremy talked about yesterday. And um, he talked about how we idealize what, or we, re, we can remember things from our childhood, but if your childhood was completely urban, what kind of environment are, you, are we talking about? Um, I, there's a visiting scholar from China who's working with me right now on urban-rural relations, and she said her awareness, having grown up in the city, came when she later in life visited her grandfather's farms and whatnot. But that that came later in life. So, uh, it's China in 2010 moved from a predominantly rural to a, a over 50% urban population. That's um, they accelerated. Uh, urbanization from 20% urban in 1980 to 50% urban in 2010. Now it's over that. The goal is to, comp it's planned urbanization. It's urbanization planning in China. So uh, there, the idea from policymakers is that we could, um, that urbanization equals modernization. Right. So this is a radical experience for many people sociologically in China, this lack of memory of what a more rural society might feel like even, so. Oh, Miles answered the question. Okay, great. Um, excuse me. Uh, Kira says, sorry about the time lag. I would love to integrate more Mediterranean sources. Do you have suggestions? I have also taught a film called even the rain about a water-related activism in Bolivia. Uh, we'll, we'll give her the suggestions in a moment. Intergen Miles says, intergenerational environmental amnesia sounds similar to the idea of shifting baselines described by the fisheries biologist Daniel Pauly. I make this a major theme of my marine environmental history class. I like the sound of inter generational environmental amnesia better though, so thank you for introducing it to me. <laughs> and then Miles also says, I hope that environmental history classes are an especially effective means of demonstrating the challenges presented by shifting baseline syndrome and of establi establishing that what we perceive of as pristine environments may have undergone human manipulation across centuries and even millennia. Yeah, quick comments. I just wanted to add something, uh, what's happening on the kind of the field of contemporary art and political ecology within China. 
a similar one like Joni's question about the under the dome and your response, uh, Robin, that uh, in graduate education it's okay, but not undergrad, certain things are controlled. Um, so a quick thing. So last year I, I pulled out from my participation in the Shanghai Biennale explicitly because of the, uh, the work that uh, the censorship committee was came after and whatnot. Anyway, that said, similar thing is happening there. So TJ Demos, one of the most influential uh, contemporary art uh, critique and historian who works at the intersection of political ecology and contemporary art, uh, did a special issue for Third Takes Journal called Contemporary Art and Politics of Ecology. I participated in that. Last year, there was an entire issue kind of informed and inspired by that that happened from China with all contributions by Chinese scholars. So it's a sort of a similar situation. And this is very kind of you know, progressive, even radical thinking in political ecology and contemporary art. So Chinese scholars picked up on that, and they did their own thing. So that's interesting. So it's kind of access to knowledge, who has and where, it's taking place. On the other hand, something like Shanghai Biennale, you can't even participate because of the censorship. So it's, yeah. So just following up on the earlier comment, I'm really surprised that this idea of shifting baselines seems to be so novel to you all. In the, eco <laughs> ec in the ecological community, this is something that we've been grappling with for over 25 years. Daniel Pauly's paper sort of formalized the idea and this notion that rural people don't have the problem is garbage. The, there have been excellent studies by uh, Mexican ecologists demonstrating that young fishermen who've never even been to Mexico City or anything like that have the same utter ignorance of what fisheries used to be like 20 years ago. This is arguably the most profound problem in trying to generate environmental awareness because people simply believe what they've seen and, and, and just ignore the history. It's, it's a huge, huge issue. And there's a, a vast literature on it in the ecological community. Yeah. I'm concerned that we didn't pick up your comment because because of the microphone. I wonder if at the beginning of the next section we can just grab a piece of it to make sure that it actually is transmitted. That was Jeremy Jackson who just weighed in on the shifting baselines and the wide literature on this issue in the sciences, which is really important. We have time for one more response from Kira, I believe, and then unfortunately we're out of time. Okay, so Kira responds to Jeremy's comment in some ways. She says, yes, we have certainly come against up against intergenerational amnesia in class. When I taught on the Singapore River cleanup, for instance, I quickly found out that my students were only aware of the official narrative rather than the unofficial stories of those that lived and worked along the river prior to the cleanup. In that sense, those memories are inaccessible to younger people because of what is told and what is left out in official accounts which is, of course, what Xiao Jing is trying to educate his students to change. So with that, I think we'll just thank our panelists. Thanks for your attention.